Chapter 23 The hour of my absence had been one of anxiety for the curate and the vicars, but my prompt return filled them with joy. "'What news?' they all exclaimed. "'Good news,' I answered. "'The battle has been fierce but short. We have gained the day, and if we move quickly, another great victory is in store for us. The bishop is so sure that no one will follow us that he will not move a finger to stop them. This will ensure our success, but we must not lose a moment. Let us address our circular to every priest in Canada.' Within twenty-four hours, more than three hundred letters were carried to all the priests, giving them the reasons why we should try, by all fair means, to put an end to the shameful, simoniacal trade in masses which were going on between Canada and France. The week was scarcely ended when letters came from almost all curates and vicars to the bishop, respectfully requesting to withdraw from the society of the three masses. Only fifty refused to comply with our request. Our victory was more complete than we had expected. But the Bishop of Quebec, hoping to regain lost ground, immediately wrote to the Bishop of Montreal, my Lord Telemis, to come to his help and show us the enormity of the crime in rebelling against the will of our ecclesiastical superiors. A few days later, to my great dismay, I received a short, very cold note from the secretary telling me that the Bishops of Montreal and Quebec wanted to see me at the palace without delay. I had never seen the Bishop of Montreal and expected a man of gigantic proportions. To my surprise, he was very small. His eyes were piercing as the eagle's, but when fixed on me, I saw in them the marks of a noble and honest heart. The motions of his head were rapid, his sentences short. He seemed to know only one line, the straight one, when approaching a subject or dealing with a man. He had the merited reputation of being one of the most learned and eloquent men of Canada. The Bishop of Quebec had remained on his sofa and left the Bishop of Montreal to receive me. I fell at his feet and asked his blessing, which he gave in the most cordial way. Then, putting his hand upon my shoulder, he said in a Quaker style, "'Is it possible that thou art Chiniqui, the young priest who makes so much noise? How can such a small man make so much noise?' There being a smile on his countenance as he uttered those words, I saw at once that there was no anger or bad feeling in his heart. I replied, my lord, do you not know that the most precious pearls and perfumes are put on the smallest vases? The bishop saw that this was a compliment to his address. He smilingly replied, Well, well, if thou art a noisy priest, thou art not a fool. But tell me, why dost thou want to destroy our three masses society and establish that new one in its ruins in spite of thy superiors? My lord, my answer will be as respectful, short, and plain as possible. I have left the three masses society because it was my right to do it without anybody's permission. I hope our venerable Canadian bishops do not wish to be served by slaves. I do not say, replied the bishop, that thou wert bound in any conscience to remain, but can I know why thou hast left such a respectable association, at the head of which thou seest thy bishop and the most venerable priests of Canada? I will again be plain in my answer, my lord. If your lordship wants to go to hell with your venerable priest by spiriting away twenty cents from every one of your honest and pious penitents for masses which you get paid for five cents by bad priests in Paris, I will not follow you. Moreover, if your lordship wants to be thrown into the river by the furious people when they know how long and how cunningly we have cheated them with our simoniacal trade, I do not want to follow you into that cold stream. Well, well, answered the bishop. Let us drop that matter forever. He uttered this short sentence with such sincerity and honesty that I saw he really meant it. He had, at a glance, seen that his ground was untenable. My joy was great indeed at such a prompt and complete victory. I fell again at the bishop's feet and asked his benediction before taking leave of him to go and tell the curates and vicars of the happy news. From that time till now, at the death of every priest, the clerical press never failed mentioning whether the deceased priest belonged to the three or one mass society we had, to some extent, diminished the simoniacal and infamous trade in masses. But unfortunately, we had not destroyed it, and I know that today it has revived. Since I left the Church of Rome, the bishops of Quebec have raised the Three Masses Society from its grave. It is a public fact that the trade in masses is still conducted on a large scale with France. There are, in Paris and other large cities in that country, public agencies to carry on that shameful traffic. In 1874, the House of Mesme was doing an immense business with its stock of masses, but the government became suspicious and the books were examined. It was then found that an incredible number of masses never reached their destination 
but only filled the purse of the Parisian mass merchant. And so the unlucky Mesmi was unceremoniously sent to the penitentiary to meditate on the infinite merits of the holy sacrifice of the mass. But these facts are not known by the poor Roman Catholics of Canada, who were fleeced more and more by their priests under the pretext of saving souls from purgatory.